I'm going to pass it over to Marshall. Thanks for being here. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to kind of go through uh, a lot of different things about the park. Of course, the presentation is titled Preservation, Protection, and Recreation. So more or less, that's the, the, the um, information we'll go over. Uh, the preservation we do here at the park, how we protect all the things that are here, and then how recreation ties into, uh, into everything that we do. Um, you can kind of see an outline of basically what we want to review. Uh, of course, I'm going to introduce myself, talk about the mission statement for the, for the park, uh, a little bit of park operation. Uh, then we'll watch a little video on the history of CAS, and then we'll get into the, the meat and potatoes of the presentation, which will be the, the preservation piece a protection piece and recreation. Um, of course, in preservation, I'm gonna talk a lot about the uh, company houses, company store, boardwalks, trains, other structures, and in recreation is kind of a lot of things we can do and how we uh, get that information out to the public. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the uh, superintendent here at Cass Scenic Railroad State Park. Um, I came to parks through a, a different avenue than a lot of other folks. Um, I worked in uh, Snowshoe Mountain Resort doing a number of things uh, in high school and through college, then uh, got an education degree uh, with a minor in folklore studies and also uh, museum work. Um, then I uh, became a social worker during the time I was a social worker, I got my master's in social work with a uh, specific piece of the degree dealing with community organization and social administration. Um, while I was there, I did like uh, child protective services, supervision, policy writing, uh, training, different things like that. And then um, did that for about 10 years. I wanted to look for something different to do. I uh, applied for a position here at CAS as assistant superintendent was hired, was assistant for two years, and then um, I've been the superintendent for three. This is my fifth year here at CAS. <clears throat> um, so let me read our mission statement to you. Uh, West Virginia State Park System's mission statement is to promote conservation by preserving and protecting natural areas of unique or exceptional scenic scientific, cultural, agricultural, archeological, or historical significance to provide outdoor recreation opportunities for citizens of the state and its visitors. Um, of course, specifically for us, we're looking at um, preserving the, the scenic area we have here, uh, the culture, and then the history. And that's the biggest piece of what we do here. Um, all that being tied into uh, all the recreational activities that are right here um, after you ride the train. Um, so park operations, we do a lot of things here. Uh, we have 23 company houses that we rent. We should have 25, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, those cabin rentals are, are all year round. So we're open 365 days a year. We stay really busy during the summer months. Uh, we kind of quiet down a little bit in November. And then in December, when people start skiing at Sinshu Mountain Resort, we get busy again. Um, we run the company store here at the, at the park. Um, so as people come and go off of the train or as they pass through on Route 66, they stop in our company stores, place to shop, use the restroom, things like that. Um, maintenance is a huge piece of what we do, uh, which ties into the next bullet point, which is preservation. So it's the maintenance of the historical town, the houses, the structures, the road. Um, we have a we have a maintenance crew. We have several full-time people and we have some part-time folks. They work really, really hard to make this place look really nice and sharp and also keep all these structures standing tall and strong. Um, of course, it's, uh, there's protection at historical site. Uh, so that has to do a lot with maintenance, but also has to do with uh, grant writing and working with other agencies that help um, preserve the history of the town and also um, give us the money in which to do so. We have a budget to, uh, to provide for the maintenance of the park, but you know, um, it doesn't hurt to have extra money and, and extra interest in different things. And that's how we get some extra things done here at the park. Um, but part of the, what we do here at CAS too is oversight of the Greenbrier River Trail. 
Um, Greenbrier River Trail is uh, 78 miles from Cass to Caldwell. Um, so we cover a, a little bit of that from the park, helping with just some of the maintenance. There's actually a crew that, that does that um, solely, but we also help out with that. Um, in the, the park here at Cass, is actually over 900 acres in size. Um, you know, most of the people are on, you know, between 20 and 40 acres of that park, but it's quite a bit larger than that. So it's oversight of all that property. Um, we, uh, we make our own water here and also treat our own sewage waste. We do that for all the folks that are in the park and then we have 38 residents and other businesses that are here locally. So it's oversight of that. Um, Part of what we do too is management of stakeholders and concessionaires. So we have a, a restaurant here, Last Run Restaurant. There's an Artisans Co-op. There's Durban Greenbrier Valley Railroad, which does the operation of our railroad here at the park. Uh, we have a barber shop amongst uh, some other folks. We just added on um, Autumn Breeze Stables. We'll be doing uh, backcountry horse rides to the wilderness cabin. Uh, where there's also a fire tower. So um, it's management of those concessionaires and stakeholders. Uh, we have a lot of programming and events for the park. Some of those are based on preservation and protection of the park. Some of them are just for fun, like festival kind of things, but it's oversight of those. And we also do laundry and delivery of that laundry for seven other state parks. Okay, the, the history of Cass. I'm gonna play a little video for you on the history of the park. And then I'm gonna talk about it ever so briefly and talk a lot about our preservation efforts and things we have that are that are active and then uh, projects that we're going to be working on. Um, of course, a lot of these uh, projects are things that we uh, are, are just ongoing. Um, I'm going to switch my share screen and see if I can make this work. Okay. Get through this commercial here. The history of the town of Cass, named for Joseph K. Cass, chairman of the board of West Virginia Pulp and Paper, follows the evolution of the lumber companies that inhabited the Greenbrier Valley and operated the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Mill. Once a symbol of the economic power that drove this valley, the mill building has been a victim of two major fires in 1973 and again in 1982. Now, only twisted steel and rusted machinery remain. Trees and vines now grow in place of where humans once toiled among the machines that manufactured lumber and fine wood products. During this heyday from 1908 to 1922, the mill operation was enormous. At its peak, West Virginia Pulp and Paper employed between 2,500 and 3,000 skilled workers. The ruined mill is now a symbol and a reminder of the past. But the story of the mill is also a story of the rails and of the steam locomotive that linked that mill with the timber in the nearby mountains. In 1901, a railroad was built to haul the massive amount of maple, cherry, birch, and oak timber from the mountains to the mill. Eventually, 250 miles of track were built to carry the timber from mountain to town. But over the years, the timber industry in West Virginia went into slow decline, and the railroad and the mill were finally shut down in 1960. However, in 1963, the West Virginia State Legislature decided the story of Cass was worth preserving and passed a bill bringing the town and the railroad into the state park system. Since that time, the Cass Scenic Railroad has been transformed from a tired, worn out, and about to be scrapped logging railroad into a first rate living museum. Well, I've lived here all my life. Well, the only thing I used to get on the log train and ride up the mountain and watch the skitters work up there. So I got to see all that. And I had brothers, you know, work 
form. I was just getting old enough to start to work for the lumber company when they closed down, so I, I missed that on that. In 1963, when the state bought the railroad, I went to work for them, and I worked 50 years on the railroad. The guys up here are, are very good at their job. It's a dying breed um, because you just can't go somewhere else like that and, and get a job. Um, of course, Lima Locomotives no longer is in operation. The building doesn't even exist anymore. So, and that's where all of our engines came from. All shades were built in Lima, Ohio. Uh, they know what they're doing, um, but it's one of those jobs that you have to pass down to the younger generation. have one engineer that's been here for 42 years. He grew up right here in this town, um, but he's been here forever. <laughs> he's had every job that there is to have. Well, when I worked on the railroad, I done it all. I started out <clears throat> repairing track, and then I went to breaking on the train. After that, I went to firing the engine. And then after that, I went to engineer. And after that, I went to conduct. is one of those places that there is no other place like Cass. You know, the engine that, that came in a little while ago, J5, that's the oldest operating J engine in the world, still on the same track that it was built for. It came here directly out of the factory in Lima, Ohio, uh, November 1st, 1905. And it's never left this operation. There's no other Shea engine in the world that has that claim to it. We also have the largest existing Shea engine in the world. Uh, it weighs 162 ton. It was also the very last Shea engine that they built. And they only used that engine for four years uh, for doing its actual work. Uh, it was built for the coal company up on in Chaffin, Maryland. Uh, and it was for a high seam of coal. Diesels cannot go up a high seam of coal. They can only do flat stuff. So they came down here, did blueprints from one of our big Shays, took it back to Lima, built this big, this big engine that we have, it's called a West Maryland Shea 6. That's also the largest one in existence now. It weighs 162 tons and it was built in 1945 and they never made another Shea. But uh, they're just set up and the gears are different on each one of them. You have the Shea that's geared down the side. The Heisler is like a V8 engine down the center and the Climax sits parallel with the track so that's that's the only difference but they're all practically works on the same same uh, system so you can't if you're a, a steam fan you can't go anywhere else and get what we have here we have all three different types of steam gear logging locomotives here uh and once the climax is out on one track that's being restored right now as far as i know cast will be the only place that has all three different types of steam gear logging locomotives and operation. I started out working for the state of West Virginia for the state park system, and but I was work I worked out of the depot doing information, uh, and then I went to work up at the company store, and I worked in a company store, uh, which is really cool. Well, as a young girl, we used to come in here, and it was a very uh, great place to visit. Uh, they had everything you wanted. When you first came in, there was a counter here that all girls like to look at because it had jewelry in it. So we would look at the jewelry. The other thing, we went to school at Cass grade school and that we uh, would get on our lunch hour. We would run from grade school out here to get an ice cream cone at the soda fountain and then go back to school. So there's a lot of memories here. Got um, clothes here. Um, Toys, Christmas toys, groceries. The other side over there was a market that you could buy groceries. Upstairs on the second floor was um, furniture. 
we got our first television set here. Uh, the third floor, we never were allowed to go up on the third floor, so I have no idea what was there. My grandfather worked at the mill. My other grandfather worked on the mountain. The, my dad worked at the mill uh, and then left and went to Maryland. But the, at the time it was closing, the mill was closing. Uh, he came back and opened up the Cass Historical Museum. It opened in 63. Uh, it was a historical museum at that time with Civil War things. Uh, in 1975, he opened up the museum, which is there now, with all the history pertaining to the cast. restore the houses as we get funds to do it. We rent out 20, but there are a lot more on, on site that we have not finished uh, restoring yet. Uh, and we rent out, we just get them restored as much as we can. Uh, but the houses are, we started build them, building them in 1901. Uh, and they started, and they weren't meant to last. They were meant to last only as long as the timber did. Uh, but you know, here we are in 2016 and they're still here. Uh, we get a lot of people come back that were raised here, born here, uh, and they always want to stay in the house that they grew up in. Uh, so, and there's been a lot of families lived in the same house, so it's always a challenge sometimes, especially during homecoming week, to get the same, you know, to get your house. So they have to rent that house normally about a year ahead of time. Uh, but everything here in town is original except for a couple buildings. Uh, I always like to tell people we're, we're not built to look old, we're just old. This house behind us is my favorite house in town. Uh, the house is, it's called the Luke House. Uh, some locals refer to it as the clubhouse also. Uh, it was built in 1918 by Charles Luke and for his wife as a summer residence. In all areas that there is a West Virginia pulp and paper or a West Vaco plant, uh, there is a Luke House. This is the only Luke House that has never been privately owned. This was started out as West, uh, West Virginia Pulp and Paper, and then it was sold to the Mauer Lumber Company whenever they bought the whole paper mill, and then the state of West Virginia whenever it became a state park. So it's never been privately owned. So it's basically like it was whenever Charles Luke built it in 1918. Okay, let me get situated here. Okay, so that was the overview of uh, the history of the park. Gives you a nice, um, a nice kind of look at uh, not only the history but kind of. Um, where we are now as a state park and what we're doing. Um, of course, I'm gonna talk a lot about those things. Uh, the houses, you know, it's still the same that we try to do them as we can. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have 23 of them refurbished now. We're gonna have a museum house, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, that'll be just for when we do our historical tours. And then we have uh, two more that are houses that have been vacant for, um, They've been vacant for nearly 40 years and there will be new rentals. So we're very excited about those and we hope to be able to keep moving along uh, Main Street and, and keep restoring those houses so we can save all those ones that are right on the main road and then work on like Luke House and some other places like that throughout the town. Um, 
So just some historical dates. I'll just go through them real quickly. Uh, you know, there's really nothing here until 1890s. Uh, there's just some farms, very sparsely uh, inhabited area. Uh, there were, like I said, there were three farmhouses here. Then in the 1890s, uh, folks started to come here to, uh, to timber. It's all the potential. And then the um, 1900s, the, railroads, the railroad arrives here in Cass, starts to become more industrious. Uh, sawmill opened in 1901. 1902, uh, a, a Cass company store opened, Pocahontas County Supply. Um, between 1900 and 1905, most of the company town is constructed. Of course, all these buildings were built to, uh, to serve the needs of the railroad and the industry and the mill, and they weren't built to be uh, long-standing structures. Um, however, here we are 120 years later and they're, they're still up. So uh, it pretty, pretty outstanding that they've been able to stand the, the test of time and uh, only through the efforts of, uh, you know, local foundations and local people, uh, the state park, um, has the town be able to stay in the, in the condition that it's in. Um, the 1920s uh, was kind of the heyday of the industry here in economics. So there was lots and lots of lumber, lumbering going on. The train was leaving here you know, every day with lots of lumber, to, uh, lots of uh, boards for um, boards coming out of the mill here and then they were being sent on for uh, paper production. Um, the 1940s, you see a decline in the logging industry, 1960s. 1960, the mill closes and lumber industry stops. Um, 1961, some folks approached the legislature. Uh, railroad was purchased in part of the town for use as a state park. 1963, the, uh, the first tourist train start. Uh, 1977, there's a, the state purchases the rest of the company town, which is all the rest of the structures here, and starts using those as, as rentals for people to come and visit. And then in 2013 was our 50th year anniversary. This is some, kind of some dates that are of importance. Um, so when we're talking about preservation, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over a couple of different slides. This is gonna be one of our um, interpretive slides that'll be in town, but I share the cast graded school because it is a it was a fantastic structure that was actually lost um, because we weren't able to preserve it. Um, of course, the school closed in the 1970s and laid, uh, laid vacant for many years. And then it, at one point, the roof became bad. And then that structure had to be demolished. Um, however, it was a beautiful structure from what I hear. This is well before um, I became park superintendent or before I came over here to visit. Um, but, uh, you, you know, that was a very, very nice structure. It had a full gymnasium in it. Um, it was a big school um, you know, at one time. They had around 400 students, uh, and it was just on the outskirts of town and within the historic district. Um, so I always think about the Cascade School. I look at these other buildings that we have in, in the park because we certainly don't want any of them to end up in the situation that the, uh, the graded school ended up. So uh, how do we tell the story about, uh, about the town um, and about logging that went on here and what, what makes this place important? I think the first place we do that is through, uh, through our train tours. Um, we have all kinds of programming. There's train tours, there's a historical theater, town tours, shop tours, store tours, and we have a museum. But the train tours is really the first place and the place where a lot of people get the information from. Whenever folks leave here on the locomotive, um, you know, there's a, a, a conductor and then there's somebody that speaks about um, all the history of the particular train ride that you're on and gives them kind of a, uh, a portal into, you know, what that experience would have been like being a logger, um, taking uh, those logs down from the mountain and back into town and, and you know, what the mill was like, things like that. Uh, the second way we do it is through town tours. We have town tours that leave um, out of the park every day, twice a day. Um, it's, a, it's an overview of the history um, of the park, of the locomotives, but mostly about the town and uh, all the different structures are still, um, still up and what their significance was. Um, you know, like I said, we have 40 company houses, 23 of them we rent. They all look 1920 on the outside. And uh, this is one way we kind of let people know a little bit more about what was going on here in the town of Cass. 
Um, we do store tours too. The store tours are more during times when the weather's in climate during the, uh, during the summer months. So if we get a day, it's really rainy and really cool. We might say, hey, instead of a town tour today, why don't we go and do a store tour? Um, a lot of people haven't really had an opportunity to go through the, uh, the cast company store and particularly through the, um, the upstairs of the store. Um, so it gives them opportunity to see, uh, you know, the store as a gift shop, but also, you know, all the things that are still here that were original to whenever uh, the store opened in 1902. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, displays that are in the store, the original displays, it's all the original wood flooring. Um, everything's been left pretty much as closely as the way it was um, during the 1920s and 1940s when it was a company store. Um, of course, modified now to, uh, to be a gift shop. Um, the Cass Historical Museum, it sits just off of the side of our restaurant. It's open um, every day. Uh, throughout the summer and then uh, on special occasions during the winter. Uh, the uh, museum was founded by Kyle J. Neighbors. It has a lot of artifacts, um, probably one of the best collections of logging tools and implements. It's the best collection I've ever seen. Um, it really gives people an opportunity to kind of see just uh, the, the way that they live, the way that they worked, all the different tools that were used. Um, we're always working on improving our museum. Right now it is a wonderful collection of artifacts and we're working on dealing more with uh, the interpretation portion of that. And currently we have uh, an exhibit from WVU in the museum that talks about um, music, um, how it affected, how it was in the, the timber camps and then um, you know, how that music kind of traveled from throughout Appalachia. Um, the Cass Historical Theater is just uh, down the boardwalk from the, um, the Cass Museum. We show a 20-minute uh, video um, about the history of the park and then also how it transitions into uh, a state park, the uh, uh, history of the town and how it transitioned into a state park. Um, that is a different video than the video you just watched, um, but it gives folks a, a good very short clip to kind of get an idea of, you know, the significance of, uh, of the park and, and of the area. Um, the Interpretive Sign Project uh, is something we're just getting ready to finish up. We, uh, we have two signs on the park, one for Camp One and then uh, one for the, um, the Mountain Inn Hotel. And we'll be getting 17 more of them. So a lot of folks will come into town and think, well, this was a, a coal mining town or something like that. And a lot of folks don't know that it was actually a logging town. So the idea is to uh, let visitors, whenever they come, be able to see uh, what these different buildings were, um, you know, what purposes they served. You know, we have a community center that was at one time a church, uh, multi-denominational, and kind of changed throughout the years. Um, you know, there was an extract plant on the other side of town. Uh, there were horse stables. Horses were a huge part of um, the logging industry, and there were around 200 head of horse here uh, whenever um, the industry was in full steam. So um, kind of let folks be able to have an opportunity, not only through the town tour, but through their own walking tour, be able to have a little bit more information about um, what the different structures are within the town. Um, do a lot of networking efforts. Uh, we're always trying to align our stakeholders. So the who's, the what's, the when's, the where's, and the objectives. Um, we've had AmeriCorps work with us a lot. Um, they've come here and done a lot of weekend projects. So that would be painting the store, painting boardwalk. Um, it was painting steps. It's been working on some of our structures. Um, some things are less historical in nature, like helping us put up Christmas lights. Um, we also had a AmeriCorps member here for one year and her project was working on the uh, interpretive signage for the town. Uh, and she's actually just finished up and she's pictured there in the, the picture to the right. Um, Youth Build has come and worked with us on a lot of projects like that too. Um, Youth Build recently just helped us redo our bathrooms in the company store. 
Uh, they really needed some revamping and they helped us put in uh, new walls, floors, um, toilets, stalls, sinks, that kind of thing. Really, really a very nice facelift. Um, we also work with West Virginia Humanities Council. Um, Pocahontas County will have its bicentennial coming up in 2021 into 2022. Um, bicentennial committee is doing a lot of things that will um, be directly connected to the park. Of course, we're a, we're a, we're a big part of that. Um, we'll be having a cast play and um, we're having different exhibits and different initiatives as a part of that. And then we work with West Virginia Culture and History. Um, they, they help us a lot too with uh, making sure we preserve our site in the way that it's supposed to be. Um, you know, we're able to um, make modifications to the inside of the houses so we're able to rent them because a lot of people, whenever they come on vacation, they want to have um, the comforts of home, you know, air, heating and air, things like that, uh, Wi Fi, television, but, you know, they want to have it still have that. 1920s feel to the outside um, of the structure and let it still feel like it's, you know, the, the town of Cass, that company town. So we work with culture history very closely to make sure that we follow um, all the rules and regulations as far as any modifications we make outside, uh, out to the outside of the structures. Um, we do a lot of special hikes. Uh, the recent one we just did, uh, WVU came up and worked on a, uh, a hike to Spruce. So uh, we drove up to the old town of Spruce and uh, we did a hike through that, that old town and uh, kind of looked at you know, what was left of what was a, a very large industrious logging town just adjacent to Cass. Um, of course, now it's, uh, it's mostly just foundations. At one time, they did go through and put up some interpretive plaques so you can kind of get a good idea of the lay of the land where, uh, where the hotel was, where... Uh, they worked on the locomotives, maybe where the mill was, things like that. Um, but doing those kind of uh, special hikes gives people another reason to be interested and invested in, in the park and what we do here. Um, Facebook and social media plays a big part in what we do. Uh, we have a foundation that actually operates the uh, the, the social media for the park. So they'll post things about the events we're gonna have and special train rides. For instance, this weekend's a parade of steam. So that's a free event where folks can kind of, kind of come and watch the locomotives uh, do drive-bys in, in, um, in front of the company store. It's a big photography weekend. Um, so there'll be lots and lots of posts on, on that page, um, as well as the page for uh, the railroad, um, we make sure TripAdvisor is, um, is up. Pocahontas County Visitor Center Bureau um, works to make sure that they share things about the park too and let them know things are going on. Um, Durban Greenbrier Valley Railroad also has a restoration page where they put up um, different information about restorations they're doing on the locomotives. Um, a lot of people are very, very interested in that and it's a really neat page. Um, history Alive is uh, another way that we kind of bring history to life here. Um, you see some pictures here with me and uh, Aust Ostalongo. Um, he's a, an Indian character that will come here and uh, do a couple of different presentations throughout the year. We get different folks who try to make it make sense for things we have going on. I think that um, this particular History Live event occurred with um, our uh, Appalachian Heritage Days, because um, you, know, you had a lot of different people through here, and of course there was an Indian population in this area also. So making people not only aware of um, you know the, the the railroad element of this of this area, but also the other history that we have. Um, so protection. Um, Casting Grover State Park is still on the endangered properties list of the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia. Um, we're looking at the um, looking at that and seeing whether or not that's actually accurate anymore. When this was done, it was quite a while ago um, in 2003. Uh, there were a lot of issues with a lot of the structures. Um, since that time, we've been able to do a lot of improvements. Um, some of the structures are still in kind of bad shape, so the ones we'll have to work on. The doctor's house in particular is one that hasn't been able to be worked on because all of the focus has gone to uh, 
the company store and all the other houses. Um, the, uh, the Mountain Inn Hotel or the maintenance shop, which is a building that you can see kind of there to your right. Um, so uh, we do our best to preserve all the, the structures to our, to our own ability, but, um, but some of them have not been able to be improved. Of course, uh, at this time, it talks about vandalism, looting, and arson um, heavily impacting uh, irreplaceable resources. That's really not something that we have going on right now. Of course, arson was a big deal at one time, and the, the, the sawmill burned two times before it got in the condition it's in now. Um, so that's, that's changed quite a bit, and that will probably change. Uh, as far as uh, whether or not we're an endangered, endangered property anymore, but I think it's relevant to mention. Um, I already talked about casting in the historic district. Um, the historic district goes through pretty much all of the town and kind of follows the railroad and actually goes across the river from the state park in the way it is right now. Um, so all those structures that are within that historic district, we have to try to keep them as best we can uh, to the way they were whenever it was uh, certified as a historic district in the register. Um, and so I've, I've talked about us working with culture and history. We really do, if we're gonna make any kind of change, uh, consult with culture and history on whether or not that's appropriate or not, if there's some kind of um, mediation that needs to occur or if we need to make an accommodation to, to make sure that we stick within um, the confines of what the town looked like uh, you know, so we can stay on that register and keep the place looking like it should. Uh, so what are we protecting? We have 40 company houses. Um, like I said, 23 of those are rentable. Uh, about 17 of them are in a stage of re repair. Um, we have uh, three of them right now that will be usable structures hopefully by the end of the year. Um, one, two of them being rentable structures and one of them being the new uh, museum house or period house. Um, we have the Cass Company Store. Cass Company Store is a building that is 300 feet long, um, 90, 90 feet deep uh, and three stories high with a full basement. Um, that building houses uh, the Cass Company Store the park headquarters, um, the last run restaurant in the museum, um, as well as our bike rental, uh, kayak rental and tube rentals in the, in the basement. Um, we spend a lot of time making sure that building looks good and we're getting ready to paint it starting Monday. So very excited to see it get a, uh, a fresh coat of paint. It definitely needs it. It's probably been, it's been well over 10 years since the last time it was painted. So it'll be a very nice facelift for uh, for the building and for the park. Um, boardwalks, we have boardwalks that go all through town. Um, it's something we're constantly working on, replacing boards, putting in new nails, things like that. Um, the boardwalks have been in place for a very long time. Um, so we replace them as we can, but it's a, it's a full-time job and one that never ends. Um, we always try to protect the view shed off of the park also. Um, and by view shed, I mean everything you see from Cass Company store looking out or, or from all the company houses. Um, so do our best to make the, that bit of property look the way it always did so you don't get the feeling that you're, uh, you're, you're just anywhere else except for a 1920s logging town. Um, the management houses aren't really included in that 40 company houses. So that would be like the Luke house that Tammy talked about in the, uh, the video we talked about the history of Cass. Um, there's also the doctor's house and there was uh, a hospital here at one time. There's also a boarding house later. Those, those big management houses are houses that we need to work on too. Of course, the Luke house, um, we've got to redo the basement and the first floor of that house, but it's um, three stories high. So there's two stories of bedrooms and bathrooms and things like that that we hope to look, work on at some point. Um, the historic locomotives are something that we're always working on protecting. Um, you can see the, the Climax locomotive uh, in the picture up to your upper right hand corner. Um, that locomotive uh, was in very, very bad disrepair. About 25 years ago, Mountain State Historical Logging uh, Association started working on that. Um, 
after 25 years, uh, they, they did all the renovations to a point. And then um, over the last few, uh, Durban Greenbrier Valley Railroad finished everything up and that locomotive is now operational. Um, and whenever uh, the track is completed from Cass to uh, Durban, we'll be the only place in the world where you can see uh, all three types of geared logging locomotives operational in the whole world. That would be uh, Shays, of which we have five Shay locomotives, uh, the Climax here, and then a Heisler. Um, and then there's other park structures too, and a lot of people maybe not think about the other park structures, but um, there's lots of outbuildings and garages and things like that. Several of them are um, still the original buildings that were here whenever it was a company town. So it's uh, maintaining all those park structures and keeping them together as best we can. Um, of course, they're all multi-use, so not only do they look the part, but we also still use them. So, you know, some of those old old garages are now garages for us for uh, state park vehicles and lawn mowers and things like that. Um, so recent improvements we got to make into the park. Uh, we had a bond project come through, through which we got to do new bathrooms and kitchens in 17 of our company houses. That was completed this year in 2021. Um, you can see on the top um, is some of those new, the new kitchen. Um, and then there's some before and after pictures of those bathrooms. Uh, in 2021, we also, uh, sorry, in 2020, we also put in uh, heating and cooling in all the houses. Before that, there was no air conditioning and the heat was uh, baseboard. Of course, at one time they were all heated by wood furnace or uh, coal burning furnace. Um, so in 2020, we got to put uh, air conditioning and central, uh, centralized heat into all of them. Um, we're also doing a painting project right now. It was part of the bond. So the painting project uh, will be painting um, 15 to 20 of the company houses and then also the Cass Company store. And that all actually starts on Monday. So we're excited to get that started. Um, we have a wilderness cabin, which is also a historical structure that's on the park property. The wilderness cabin uh, is associated with the uh, Bald Knob Fire Tower. Um, so that fire tower is still standing, uh, as is the cabin. The cabin was in pretty good shape, but we have a concession here that's come in and done a lot of work to it. So it's in really wonderful shape now and will soon be the site of, um, well, it's actually open now for business. You can ride a horse for, from Modern Breeze Stables at Silver Creek to that cabin, spend the night, and very soon we'll be able to go up in the, uh, the fire tower. The fire tower work starts on Monday. Um, we have some other upcoming projects. Uh, there's always things going on. Of course, uh, we just extended the rail trail. So it used to end in front of uh, the Cass Company houses. It will now uh, terminate in front of the Cass Company store. So we added about, about a quarter mile of trail um, right along the rail. Um, really makes for a nice entrance into the park. Um, there's um, always preservation interpretation projects going on. The interpretation project is a sign project that I was talking about. Um, so that is in progress and that will soon um, hopefully be, uh, everything will be approved and we'll be able to get those signs in the ground. Um, I like to see them sometime during the summer. Uh, renovations on the houses. We're working on houses 241 and 239 currently. Uh, 241 will be our next rental house. Hopefully have it done by September. And then 239 will be sometime after that. Of course, the Luke house is a house that we always are uh, working on getting um, monies to work on. That's a large house you can see up there to the right. Um, we have a lot of different ideas about how we'd like to use that. Um, and I think that we're going to be able to preserve that something here in the future. Of course, I already talked about boardwalks. Um, there's actually a, uh, a suspended boardwalk bridge that we're hoping to put back to. Uh, it was kind of behind the company store. Um, of course, the doctor's house and the hospital are two of the larger structures that are right there behind the store that uh, we continue to want to work on and hopefully we'll get a chance to, to address. So I uh, talked a lot about history and preservation, all things we're doing, but I'm going to talk a little bit about recreation and then I'll I'll take some questions before we, uh, we run out of time. Um, 
of course, they have all this history going on, but we, you know, we got to draw people in, let them get an opportunity to kind of see what we have offered here at the park. Um, you just see some of these pictures here. We, uh, we're right on the Greenbrier River. Uh, so whenever the water is high, uh, high enough, you can float the Greenbrier River from, from Cass to Cloverlick or even down to Marlington if you, if you want to do it in a really long one day or, or two days. Um, we have a lot of animation on the park as far as uh, we bring characters in like Smokey the Bear and Eddie the Eagle. Of course, both of those characters have um, their own uh their own information to share, whether it be about, um, you know, fire protection or gun safety, things like that. Um, so we schedule a lot of events throughout the summer. Like I said, some of them are historical in significance. Some of them are uh, more uh, festival kind of events. Um, we do do an Appalachian Heritage Festival, which really focuses on the park and Appalachia and music, things like that working with WVU on some programming this summer. They're gonna be here four different times um, where they'll be doing some things specific to, uh, to logging camps and music and things like that. Um, picking on the porch uh, occurs every Saturday. It's actually a, a volunteer event. So we have uh, local musicians that come play music on the porch. They play a lot of, uh, a lot of older tunes, but they can play whatever they want while they're there. Um, really been a, a fun thing for uh, not only the, the people that are here locally that want to play some music, but also for, um, you know, uh, the folks that are coming here to ride the train or visit the town and uh, get to have that experience. Um, Harvest Day is kind of like a, uh, a, a festival we have here. Lots of games, activities, things like that. Um, just a nice event to bring people in. And uh, we have a couple of different foot races. Uh, the stump runs our 5K. We always have a pretty decent participation for it. Um, our last one just occurred last weekend. Uh, nice to have it back after um, a year with, with COVID and, and no races and fewer people than normal. But uh, we got to get away from that and have a, a back to a normal race. Um, we're also the... Uh, the start of the Greenbrier River Trail Marathon. The Greenbrier River Trail Marathon, of course, 26.2 uh, miles, um, goes from Cass to, uh, to Marlington. Um, it is a Boston Marathon qualifier and the, uh, the only marathon that I'm aware of that goes on a 1.5% downgrade the entire way. Because um, you're, you're running in the rail bed and it goes right by the river and a one and a half percent downcline the whole way into Marlton. Um, yeah, I just want to share this with you. It's kind of neat. The, uh, the Greenbrier River Trail Marathon is probably the only marathon uh, in the world that starts with a train whistle. So uh, on the morning of the marathon, we have uh, the locomotives come down and we do our count off and then they blow the whistle on the train and then uh, your marathon runners take off from there. And you can see our uh, 2019 uh, medal for finishing was actually a train whistle. Um, I just like to share this when I do a, uh, any kind of presentation. This is a postcard that somebody shared with me. It says, uh, a lot of nice girls in Cass, West Virginia, but none like you. I thought it was just kind of interesting. Um, then there's my contact information. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, feel free to do so. Um, email works well. Uh, phone will work also. Um, so I'll open up for questions now. That was great. Thank you, Marshall. And thank you for sharing that there is outdated information on our website that must be hidden away in some corner of the internet. So I'm going to look into that. I made a note. And um, I had a question if anyone wants to submit some in the chat too. Um, I haven't received any yet, but I did have a question about um, what do you feel is like some of the biggest obstacles that you guys face in having to care for so many buildings? You have a lot of properties that you guys are taking care of. Um, I think the hardest part is just finding um, all the people and all the skilled people that you need to do the work that you have to do because it's a overwhelming amount of work. Um, so, uh, you know, we have, we have a handful of skilled people that work here on the park, um, but it's nowhere near enough to always keep up with everything. So we're always seeking out um, 
you know, different, different organizations to kind of help with whatever they can help with, whether it be something small like, um, you know, painting a boardwalk or painting a fence um, to something larger like redoing the bathroom or helping with funding, things like that. So I think that's kind of the biggest thing we run into is just um, making sure we keep up with everything. I, I think that we stay on track the best we can by being organized. So uh, identifying, you know, where the, the biggest problem areas first and keeping those up and doing as much preventive maintenance as possible. Well, it looks like you've inspired one person to want to make another trip. I've spent a lot of time in CAS being since I used to live nearby. Um, yeah, so any chance to ride in the locomotive cab is one question that just came in. Is there any chance to ride in the locomotive cab? Absolutely. Come down and talk to me. We can, uh, we can probably make that happen for you. Great. Yeah, I know that um, we look forward to partnering more. You guys have a lot of opportunities for, it seems like, volunteers to come down as well. And we've liked to partner through AmeriCorps in the past. And the relationship with Youth Build seems really awesome too. And I just wonder if you have people in the community who volunteer to help with some of the different activities that you're putting on as well as like keep doing maintenance things. We do. We have, uh, we have two, we have one foundation. It's kind of two parts. Um, so there's the Mountain State um, Historical Railroad and Logging Association. Um, they're actually a very large group. So uh, they're about 325 people in, in size. Um, of course, they're scattered all throughout the United States. So um, only a handful of those folks are actually local. A lot of them live, uh, a lot of the ones we actually see that participate a lot live like in, in Maryland, D.C. and Pennsylvania and things like that. And they'll come in and do projects as they can. Now, we do have a, a group of folks that live here locally that help out a lot with particularly different events that we have. Um, we, uh, those folks will help with um with different maintenance projects, but also a lot with just um, festivals and activities like we do a lot for like for Halloween and for Christmas. And a lot of local community really gets involved in that. And that's a big part of what we want to do too is being a state park because we're for uh, for the, the visitor that's coming from, from far away, you know, whether that be, you know, Maryland, Ohio, whatever that is, but also for, uh, for local people to come and recreate too. So um, yeah, we, we get those folks that come to, come to volunteer, but we can always use more. Awesome. Well, yeah, I look forward to us being able to partner again through Preservation Alliance, um, it's AmeriCorps program, and then maybe in other ways as well in the future. Um, so just one final call for questions and a reminder that um, I'll be posting this, this webinar onto the Preservation Alliance's YouTube channel. And we have others from the last year and a half that we've done. So you can check those out as well. Um, and I just want to also thank Marshall for presenting today. This was very informative. And um, I think that's all I have. It doesn't seem like anybody else has anything. So thank well, you. And, and Daniel, I'll tell you, I've, I've talked with Gibbs Ketterman about that, um, that designation on your website. So that's something we're working on. So. Yep. Yeah. I need to follow up on that. I know I have something somewhere, so I'll get it corrected for you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. And we will have another webinar in July. I think it's July 15th with Susan Pierce from the State Historic Preservation Office. She's going to do a webinar about the residential historic tax credit. So you can check that out and we'll be sending registration information out about that as well. So thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you.